Okay, welcome back, and I hope you've had a chance to uh, read the paper that we uh, assigned. Um, there's a lot of technical jargon in this paper, and I don't want it to scare you if you're not uh, accustomed to genetics. So I'm really going to just highlight a few points that I want you to focus on, uh, which are really uh, essentially the way in which we're using these uh, specialist genetic techniques, but we're using them in a, in a way that as epidemiologists we're very accustomed to using them in a case control study or a series of case control studies. And then I want to highlight a few uh, wrinkles, if you will, uh, that are a little bit different from the techniques that you're accustomed to if you're just thinking about one study at a time. So actually the first thing to notice about genetic epidemiology is inherent in the list of authors here for this paper. Uh, genetic epidemiology has turned into a very much a team science. Uh, we've discovered that to robustly identify variation in the genome, uh, it's very important to have a large number of studies, maximize the sample size, and so that means we wind up collaborating with uh, a, a lot of colleagues uh, around the world, and so the name of the game here in many ways has been to form uh, consortia to do collaborative studies to maximize sample size. So this is a paper where uh, we co-discovered for the first time a specific variant uh, that is associated with breast cancer. Uh, it's called sporadic breast cancer here in the title. Uh, and that indicates that we didn't study this in families in which uh, breast cancer was very common. That's usually called familial breast cancer. We studied this in regular case control format in series of uh, women who were unfortunate enough to be diagnosed with breast cancer, but without focusing on the women who had a specific family history. So again, this is the uh, fairly conventional epidemiologic study design, a series of cases and appropriate controls. The uh, initial stage that we discussed earlier is the genome-wide stage where we uh, apply tools that can test many hundreds of thousands of variants uh, in the genome across as many cases and controls as we can. In this case, about 1,100 cases and a similar number of controls. Um, and then we display the data and we skim off the most extreme associations. So I showed you the Manhattan plot in the last example. Um, at the time we did this, uh, I think the Manhattan plot hadn't been invented or is just being invented. So this is the rainfall plot. But it's exactly the same principle, except here, the smaller the p-value, the lower down the y-axis it appears. And uh, each chromosome is represented, and we've just uh, represented the p-values that are less than 10 to the minus 2, or 0.01. And uh, so the, the further down the dot appears, the uh, more extreme the p-value. Uh, so there were extreme p-values here on chromosome four, uh, chromosome seven, chromosome 10. This one immediately attracted interest because they appeared to be in a gene called fibroblast growth factor receptor two. And any of you who are interested in oncology will know that anything that's called a growth factor receptor immediately attracts interest uh, if you're uh, interested in a causation of cancer. Uh, so we were able to take initially in the replication phase um, only a very small number of these variants, six in fact, um, but representing the chromosome 10, 4, and 7 uh, initial hits, called hits in the business. Um, but these are all uh, variants. You can ignore these IRS numbers. That's just the code that each variant in the genome is given. But you can see from the length of the code that there's a lot of variants in the databases. Here's a chi-square. Here's a p-value. As you can see, there's an impressive number of zeros uh, in front of the uh, digits here. An odds ratio for heterozygotes, so the odds ratio for people who've inherited one copy of the variant allele. An odds ratio for homozygotes, so people who've inherited two copies of the variant allele. And sometimes these variants come uh, in the neighborhood of a gene. So I mentioned FGFR2. Uh, here are other gene names. And this gives us a clue, perhaps, uh, but only a very preliminary clue to whether this is something that we should be 
more interested in. So um, these were tested in a much larger number of cases and controls. Uh, so this is table two from the paper. Uh, the total is about almost 3,000 cases, uh, over 3,000 controls. Um, but now from uh, four different studies, each of which were independent nested case control designs. So the nested case control design you talked about earlier in the context of biomarkers, um, it's a little different from a regular population-based case control design in that we actually do a case control study in the context of a much larger number of people who are enrolled and enumerated in a cohort study. And uh, in very brief, we uh, wait for cases to occur in the prospective study, so those are the series of cases, and then we sample uh, from the non-cases uh, the controls. And there's a few different ways of doing that, but uh, essentially the principle is the same as any case control study, except the difference is we have a full list or full census of the people in the population that gave rise to the cases. Those are the initial members of the cohort study. So um, it turned out that of those six variants, five of them didn't replicate. Uh, five of them showed no evidence for association in this replication phase. And that's very typical of these large-scale studies where we go in um, without any specific hypothesis for specific variants. We screen at the first stage uh, agnostically, uh, looking at every variant in the genome. Uh, some of these uh, rise to the top of the Manhattan plot uh, and have the most extreme p-values. Now we take them into a replication phase, and lo and behold, most of them drop out. They were just chance associations. They were just false positives. But if we're lucky, some of them will hang in there. And you can see in each study, um, except one, uh, the association with carrying two copies of the variant at the uh, particular site here in FGFR2 was uh, somewhere between a 1.8 and two-fold increase in risk. Uh, one study was positive, 1.22, a 22% elevation in risk. But note that the p-value in that study um, is not close to the 0.05 level. And so uh, we might say normally, well, three of these studies are positive, and one of them is not positive. The key is when we get multiple studies is to use uh, a technique called meta-analysis in which we can summarize across studies uh, what the summary information is that all of the studies give us at one time and generate a uh, summary estimate or summary odds ratio and confidence interval and a summary p-value. And uh, when we do that, the uh, odds ratio is about 1.64 here for the women who carry two copies of the variant allele. Not a huge association in risk by any means, but highly, highly significant. 1.1 times 10 to the minus 10, so 1.1 with nine zeros in front of it. And uh, one of the questions I'm going to ask you is, um, why do we insist on such small p-values in these genome-wide association studies? But this actually fulfills the criteria for what we think of as genome-wide significance. It fulfills the criteria for a positive association, uh, accounting for the fact that we've tested at hundreds of thousands of points across the genome. So um, that's the epidemiologic piece of the paper. Again, uh, unless you're particularly interested in genetics or you already come with a background in genetics, just try and focus in on those couple of tables in the paper. And then uh, let's now go to questions for discussion. Five questions. Why do we insist on very, very small p-values in genome-wide association studies? As you've learned in the context of uh, the rest of the course, most of the time, we'll accept a p-value of 5 times 10 to the minus 2 or 0.05 or less in order to declare statistical significance in a specific study. And here I'm saying that we need very, very small p-values of the order of 10 to the minus 8, 
in this case it was less than that, 10 to the minus 10, before we declare success, if you will, and say we have a finding here that we think is robust and will replicate. So why is that in the context of genome-wide association studies? Why do we need very large samples for these genome-wide association studies? Some of the uh, examples that you've studied so far have a few hundred cases, a few hundred controls, a result that was compelling and impressive and credible. Here, I'm saying that we need uh, thousands of cases, and, and this was one of the very first genome-wide association studies. It was one of the first genome-wide association studies for breast cancer. In the subsequent five years, uh, we've gone on to do many, many much larger studies, and, and now the largest study has more than 50,000 cases of breast cancer, 50,000 controls. Why have we moved into this very, very large sample size domain when it comes to these genetic results. Let me ask you a question that would apply to any uh, association study or case control study. Association study is the jargon that the genetic epidemiology uh, community uses for what we would consider as observational studies. So association studies are distinct from randomized clinical trials where we're assigning the exposure. Association studies, case control studies, cohort studies. We're not assigning the exposure. It's not an experimental design in that sense. And so we're looking for association or what is often called correlation uh, in our statistics. Doesn't matter, uh, in this case for a disease like breast cancer, that it's likely that unfortunately some of the women who are controls in these studies will go on to develop breast cancer later in their lives. Uh, we didn't know that they should potentially have been in the case group when we did the study, um, is that a big deal? And the sort of hint here is that uh, breast cancer affects about one in nine women. You might want to think about this question for a very rare disease that affects one in uh, a thousand people, for instance. You might want to think about this question um, for a trait like high blood pressure, where by the time people are in their 80s and 90s, uh, a very high proportion of the population has developed high blood pressure as on treatment for high blood pressure. So this is kind of a middle scenario, about 10% uh, of women will develop breast cancer. Think of it for the very rare case, think of it for the even more common case or much more common case. One of the studies didn't have a statistically significant result that was independently significant. The result leaned in the same direction, but was not a p-value of less than 0.05. So think a little bit why uh, the results observed in the first study mightn't replicate in any study or mightn't replicate in all of the studies in the replication phase. What are, so what are the reasons um, behind failure to replicate or inconsistency in replication? And finally, um, we had th four studies there. Three were clearly statistically significant at the 0.05 level, so I could say three out of four studies were significant. Maybe that sounds impressive, but one wasn't. So um, why might a meta-analysis where we get a statistical summary of uh, the best estimate across studies, across all the data of the findings, why may that be superior to the other way of counting up studies, which is to say, uh, I've got a large number of studies of the same thing here. This number were positive, uh, this number were not positive, and uh, this leads me to believe that the association is real or not. What do we get out of a meta-analysis where we get a single summary point estimate that we don't get out of that uh, counting positive and null studies? So those are the questions for discussion. Uh, good luck with the discussion boards, and I look forward to seeing you on the discussion boards uh, and maybe returning uh, to explain a few of the nuances here if uh, time permits. Thank you.